This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Ying.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. Welcome to You Are What You Love, your window into the future of spirituality. We're going to talk to you about your life and the evolution of your soul while we bring alive the essence of eternal truth. So here is your host, the author of You Are What You Love, Waishali. Welcome to another exciting episode of You Are What You Love. I'm your hostess, Waishali, and we have with us one of our favorite people, Mr. Curtis Childs. He's brought to us courtesy of the Swedenborg Foundation, and he's on YouTube. His channel is called Off the Left Eye. You can also go to offthelefteye.com. You can even go to the podcast, Inside Off the Left Eye. Um, There's a whole lot of Off the Left Eye going on. And if you are interested in calling in and asking Curtis a question about things of a spiritual nature, you're welcome to call in at 844-390-8255. That's 844-390-8255. So, Curtis, welcome back, sweetheart. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. You guys have been cooking at over at Off the Left Eye. Um, uh, I've been uh, really enjoying some of your programming. You've got this new series, Chasing Swedenborg, and I, I want to get into that because that is a very, um, very thought-provoking, and it's a really good conversational catalyst for, you know, going deeper. And um, yeah. I, I made some notes from some of your shows. I've been, the Chasing Swedenborg, I've been really enjoying them. I think probably my favorite was when you went to the park to find the teeter-totter and you couldn't, so you did it from the children's playhouse. <laughs> yeah, right. Work with what's in front of me. Well, it, it, metaphorically, it, it was perfect. And, you know, it also, uh, on a very visual uh, way that kind of reaches back into our mind also reminds us that when we were kids, we didn't have a problem playing and we could be in the moment. And when we were playing house, we never in our playing imagined that we got an insurance bill we couldn't pay. Yes, or, or, or a tax bill as tax season is, is on us here. I, I never played house when I was a kid where I got a call from Orkin telling me that I got termites. It just <laughs> no, didn't happen. But um, yeah. uh, so I wanted to give you an official kudos for all the stuff you've got. The um, Swedenborg and Life, News from Heaven, the Chasing Swedenborg, and you've got the podcast with Chelsea, um, which I've really been enjoying. Those are just priceless. And um you know, Curtis, you you and most of the other people that um, are in Breath, Bren Athen and and in the Swedenborg Church, you, you were born into it. It's a it's a multi generational thing. So these ideas are things that you've just always known. When you got introduced to the church, you know, you got introduced to it authentically, and the rest of us, we kind of got what the church has become. And it's really interesting. Um, I think I must have listened to volume one of True Christianity, uh, book on audio file. I must have listened to it for about a year and a half, just over and over and over and over again. I, I'd listen to a section maybe 30 times and then move on and just did a really deep dive on um, on that book, uh, True Christianity. And I grew up in, um, in mainstream America, Christian, Methodist, um, milk toast as it gets, denomination. And when I watch your shows, like when I watch the show about the baptism and the Holy Communion, it's yeah. really interesting when you've got what it's about, what the intention is, how you connect with it, 
when I watch it on Off the Left Eye, and I, I, I get it from Swedenborg's writings, and then I hold it up to the version of reality that I grew up with, how I got taught it, how I got introduced to it, it's, um, it's shocking. And one of the things that Swedenborg talks about a lot is that we're at the end of this cycle because the church has lost its truth. There is no more church. There's no more truth in the church. It's gone. And that getting the truth is essential because this is our operating system. And if you're trying to hit a heavenly goal and you're shooting an arrow at the target, a great um, analogy Swedenborg uses, if your trajectory before you let go of that arrow is just even off by a minuscule mark, by the time that arrow gets to the target, it's a mile off. And when you think about the fact that truth is the blood, our blood in our body, it's the life blood in the church, and what happens when somebody loses all of their blood? They die. You, it, you, you can't bleed out and stay alive. And it's been just so interesting having grown up in how they teach about this in the world today from a corpse that has no blood in it to then stepping over into the world where there's this like real life thing with real beings and it's not dead. And um, the first thing that struck me about it, I have to tell you, is baptism. And you brought up something I never heard of. And that was that baptism happens usually only once, it's only intended to happen once, uh, unless you have it when you're a little baby and you wanna do it again as an adult, you know, then it's twice, but it's usually only done once. And it's done as a ritualistic correspondence uh, relationship with officially entering into a community, officially entering into a church. I had never heard that about baptism at all, ever. I never, I'd, so when I heard that, I. I thought, okay, this is interesting. I vaguely remember during confirmation when I was 12, they said, we're going to do baptism. They just did it with the sprinkling of the water. And uh, they said, we're doing it now in confirmation because it's officially marking your starting your relationship with the truth, with, with the church. I vaguely have remember something like that being said, but it, 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 it it was by no means a demarcation mark that they m made part of the event. And my takeaway from baptism, I'm hoping you'll find this hysterical, and everyone that I talked to also that grew up in mainstream Christian church and said, what is baptism about to you? What did you hear it was about? What was, did you hear you were supposed to focus on? Well, give me in, in a in a telegram, what did you hear baptism was about? And everybody said the same thing I did. It's a ritual that allows you to commit to dying to your old self and resurrecting as a new creature in Christ. And the idea is when you go under the water, your, your old self is dying, your old ancestral insanity, plagued self, your old issues, your old hellish ways a bit, you're dying to all of that. They didn't have the symbology of you're dying, you're, you're surrendering to the truth, to the water. And then you're coming up this new creature. And I never heard that it was only supposed to be done like one, maybe two times. So I have to tell you, every time I get accidentally sprayed by a garden hose, um, I go through a car wash, um, I get rained on, um, uh, I take a shower, I, I I'm having a baptism. I'm, I'm making this moment about dying to the old petty things and coming up a new creature. When I hear the song, Take Me to the River, I always stop and go, okay, we're having a baptism moment. Let's connect with this intention because that's what this moment is about. And so finding out that, that, that my relationship with it and how it was intended and put into motion 
are widely divergent. It was it was a very it was very educational. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for for sharing um, not just what stuck out to you about that, but a little of your own journey. Um, I, I that's cool. The idea of I'm getting I'm getting a little baptism here. I'm getting a little baptism there. And I think that we got to make sure that we are careful to identify, even though they work as a unit, the body and the soul are two different things. So everything that is has an internal or a spiritual part of it and an external or a physical part of it or an inner and outer part. So that's why, you know, you could, uh, a body without a soul is, is a sad occasion, right? Because it's, it's just death. So you, you look at, the, you have the external event, which is the baptism, right? And the water and the ritual, and it's, you know, done different ways in different parts of Christianity. There's analogous uh, rituals in other religions. That's, that's you know, the problem is if we can confuse the body with the soul. So the body and soul are meant to work in tandem. So yeah, you can't you can't have a single event that's gonna that's external that's going to uh, uh, affect as massive a change as you're talking about this internal. So you can't just say, yeah, I'm gonna have one event where I go into the water and that's gonna free me from all of my my hellish ways. I mean, that is not the way that complicated things work, right? It, it takes a lot of time. Now, baptism can be this meaningful symbol. It's not that you can just do away with it. If you have this symbol, it's this, this commitment, like you're saying, but we also talked about the communion being the ongoing commit, you know, the sort of recommitment to that. So in a way, yeah, you, if you're, if you're, if you're being reminded of your baptism, you know, through all those things, but if, it doesn't matter if you're, if you got the external component, it doesn't matter if you got baptized, if you're not doing the internal stuff, which is if you, if you're not, Okay, so you, if the baptism is this symbol of I'm going to join into the church and, and try to, which I think the spirit of that is, right? I'm going to try to move out of all this negative stuff that I'm habitually inherited uh, tendencies toward. Um, yeah, but that, that's, that's a complex process. That's like, think about try, if you're trying to correct your posture. Yeah. That is not something you just stand up straight. And now it's fixed. No, there's a whole, <laughs> there's layer on layer there. And, and it's in, in things you wouldn't even think of. It's not just that you're not standing up straight. It's that your back muscles are underdeveloped. It's that your the cartilage between your ribs and the front is tight. There's so much stretching and exercising. And, if, you know, and if you just go around trying to hold your shoulders back, it, eventually you're going to, uh, it's, you're going to get sore in other areas. So it's, it's this huge, the internal stuff, right? Because that's just the difference. Like, if you think about the body being in this little image of that, or ex the, the external, like, simple action of just standing up straight is one thing. But to get all those complicated internal structures to change that, that have all these millions and millions and millions of cells in them that need to realign, these tissues, that, that is this huge process, and it takes continual effort and a and, and, and really particular effort. So... The baptism is, but if you didn't have the external actions, if you didn't, you know, to also stand up straight, you would never have the posture too. So you got to have those two working together. And baptism, like a satisfying explanation of it, is one that that honors the the external side of it, and but also the internal side too, and the work that needs to go in there. And um, uh the Holy Communion show, anyone who thinks that you have an understanding of baptism and Holy Communion, or you, you don't have an understanding, I really got to encourage you to either go to youtube.com forward slash off the left eye or go to off the left eye.com and watch these two episodes. I think you find it fascinating to compare to your experience of how you were raised, but um, you guys do a great job of breaking down the language, because although the mainstream Christian um, denomination that I grew up in had the idea of, you know, the ritual and and the bread and the wine and all this, they they did not understand correspondence whatsoever. Did that was just that that 
understanding of it was completely barren. So you've got a very pedestrian, you know, literal version of it that doesn't connect you with it with with the deep intention that that is the the purpose of the ritual that is the potential of the ritual and you when the holy communion you guys did some great conversations about why it's eating the bread and drinking the wine and you did such a great job of talking about what that corresponds to it's not literally eating it's not a cannibalism it has nothing to do with that that right. it, it it, it's a correspondential language, a symbolic language. And as I was listening to you, you know, break that down in the show about Holy Communion, I was really getting a much better understanding of where all this language appears in the book of Revelations, where you're instructed to eat people and eat chariots and eat all kinds of stuff that yeah. just doesn't sound like something God would really be asking you to have on your dietary routine. Yes. Uh, eat a book. John, John famously eats a book that is sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his stomach. There is this. Yeah. If, if you don't know why you're doing something. Yeah. And the thing doesn't make intrinsic sense on its face and nobody can really tell you why you're doing it. Eventually you're going to reject it. So people who are told, look, you need to do this, something like a, a ritual of Christianity, like a baptism or a Holy Communion. And, and it's something strange. You don't just, in the rest of the culture, there's not something like that. You don't just get up and you want to play with your friends. Like, what do you want to play? Hopscotch? Well, let's, let's, let's break, break bread and, and, and like do this water ritual. Like it, it's, a, it's a very regimented, specific thing. And it's a little strange. And unless you have a really good reason for why you're doing it, everyone's going to eventually say, well, why do we need to do this? And, and, and you're also not going to get what the importance of it is. And, this, and so either you come up with, if, if you're divorced from the correspondence, which gives you the, the reason for being and unlocks how it can be a, an actual tool, which is the correspondence is what I was talking about before with the, the correspondence is a means by which the, the body and the soul of something interact. So, a ritual that makes you understand why you do the specific elements. I mean, you mentioned the cannibalism side of it. Yeah, if Jesus is saying, look, here's my blood and here's my flesh, I go, well, I, I'll try to put them back on you. I'm so sorry. That, like, I'm not going to eat them. That's not what you do to your teacher. Um, so, the yeah, to, to not have that explanation for, for what these are, not only why they make sense, but why they're worth doing i think what you end up with is is like you were describing that you have these tons of people leaving christian churches and not because they want to go be bad and oh the church won't let me gamble and smoke you know think of like sort of a cartoony idea of what a hooligan would be in the like 50s you know like that that's not why people are leaving churches it's it's because the church is don't make sense and don't seem to have any of this morality that the people are looking for. It's just, it's just, in the end, it's just a bizarre experience. What, what is this thing? And that is when you don't have the truth, you don't understand why you're doing stuff. Why, why, how do you, if you expect anyone's going to want to be a part of that when it doesn't, everything else in the world that we're doing, we're doing because it makes sense. So you got to have the reasons you got to, it's, it's worth spending the time to study that and understand it. Um, and that's really the only way that it, you're going to be able to say, oh, I love doing this. I love having this thing in my life. And I know exactly why I'm doing it. Because um, that's usually the criteria we use when we select if something else is going to be part of our life. And um, I, Chelsea is always such a delightful addition to the conversation. And I really appreciated her sharing about her ongoing relationship with taking Holy Communion and how she makes her own bread and she has her own, you know, wine. And it's something she really looks forward to and talked about how <clears throat> there's a contemplative self-examination part of the process that she finds takes her deeper and deeper 
now that she's in the habit of doing it. And, um, and I, 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 that's pretty much what the baptism has been for me, you know, up until now, because, um, as ironic as it sounds, doing the baptism occurs to me all the time. You know, if I spill water on myself in the car, it's an inadvertent baptism. I want to die right now to the <laughs> old self. Um, but the, the Holy Communion, um, uh, I, I've never done it outside of church. Honest to God, it never even occurred to me to do it outside of church. But I love the way that um, you guys reintroduce this relationship in a way of um, mindfully engaging with it to get the most based on your experience of having done it for, you know, quite a few years. So that was really, really valuable. Yeah, it's got to be real. We have it has to be real. We yes, right. We've got we we sure this Swedenborg stuff. This this particular explanation of Christianity. Yeah, it's it's something that's been in my life since I was little. Right, and and I've got other people that I like and admire who are involved in it, but. Unless it's really, unless you can get alone with it in a room and it's actually giving you something valuable, unless you can investigate it for yourself and really feel oh, this is deep, and, and I can, I'm, I'm interested in engaging with this and getting a rewarding relationship because of my actual experience with the thing. You know, if it's real, if it's real for you, uh, that's the only way you're going to really get people sticking with it and, and and people like us wanting to spend our time on something like Off the Left Eye, where we are constantly talking about it. You mentioned the show Chasing Swedenborg. Chasing Swedenborg is me trying to show as as directly as possible what it's like for me to ingest, you know, we're talking about eating and drinking some of these ideas and, and live it, what they mean to me in particular in my life in the hopes that you can get this window into what it looks like to digest this stuff and then that will help you when you're doing your own thing. Right? You're describing your, your, your baptisms that you have in the car. That's great. My, I was just going to mail some letters and they had gotten soaked by being under my backpack where there was a water bottle. And uh, next time I'll think of it as they got, they got a little baptism there. Yeah. Um, so, so if it's not, look, if it's not real, if it's, if it's something that has to be mediated, if it's, if you're telling me about all this religious stuff and you're telling me that, there's God and it's so important and everything, but I don't feel it. And, and it has to be someone else who's in a, who's in a position in, in a church organization is, is telling me it. And I never feel it for myself. I can be educated by people. I can be led by people, but unless it's also happening for me and it's feel and it's real, um, then it's, it's on borrowed time. Eventually you're going to spew it out, uh, or 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 so everyone else will, and they'll be they'll be off and looking for something that's authentically real. So it's a very important part of of what I'm doing and what the rest of the team is doing is, and actually I should say it's so almost in the reverse. The only reason why the people you see on um, on our shows are there in the first place is because they found it to be real, and and yeah. they, and nobody's compelling them to talk to people about it. No one's compelling them to do it. You know, there's plenty of people that were in, you know, that were raised around Swedenborg stuff who are, are way far away from it now and don't, don't care about it, don't like it. So there's not like societal pressure. We're not there because we have to be there. There's not that much reward. As you said, ba barely anyone knows about Swedenborg. It's not like, oh, I'm going to look at, at the internet and there's just this lucrative Swedenborg scene there and I want in on that. No, I mean, we're, we're having to, yeah, as I, most of the people that we're interacting with, this is the first time they ever heard of it. Um, why keep doing that? Well, it's because it's real to us. To, to me, I'll speak for myself. It's it's real, and I can see it helps me every day. It helps me every every single day. It's helping me, and, and tangibly so. And so, it's the thing I'm most excited to equip other people with. I think there's a Vedic saying, something along the lines of, "The sweetest, most nutritional fruit is always found under the leaf." Mm, yeah. Um. There was something that you brought up in the show where you guys are all answering questions. And it was a, a really interesting point that was made about not fantasizing about harming others. 
And yeah. I know we all get, you know, pissed off at the guy at the f traffic light that's making you late. And I, I know we all have our moments where we forget the bigger picture and suddenly it all becomes about how we're entitled to our rage or our impatience or whatever it is. Um, you know, we're all guilty of being human. Um, but there, you know, I recently got a letter from a friend and they said that they were concerned about um, my thinking and my philosophy in life. And um, they wanted to reach out as a friend to, you know, tell me what their concerns were about, you know, their concerns that they had with me or they perceived or wanted to talk about. And then right after yeah. that, Curtis, this person went on a two paragraph diatribe about all the people that they hate, listing all the things that they've determined as judge and jury, these people are guilty of this, 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 this to concentrated two paragraphs of all these wrongdoings he knows these people are guilty of and all the things that he wants to see happen to him. And then in the end, he said, I hope that you can get your life together and be the nice, sweet, loving person I used to know you to be. <laughs> and um, right. so um, in, in my, when you get a letter like that, obviously it's emotionally booby trapped. You can't do anything without setting the person off. So um, I, I did my best to do a, um, a decommissioning of an incendiary communication. And basically, um, one of the things that I brought up that this goes into, but the average, again, the average mainstream Christian person doesn't think about it. And that is, um, when I wrote back to my, my friend, I was saying that um, uh, I don't hate anybody. Um, there are there are people, plenty of people on the planet that I pray and it would be my heart's desire for them to stop spiritually mutilating themselves and thereby hurting others. But I, I don't hate them. I'm just heartbroken that they're doing this incredibly spiritually destructive self thing to themselves. And um, that when the Ten Commandments says, do not kill, it we we take it to mean literally don't kill your wife so that you can get her insurance you know don't pull that right. trigger don't we don't we don't think of it in any other way than the than a toe tag on a body in the morgue that that's that's what do not kill means and i was sharing in the letter that one of the things that that the divine has asked us to do is to when it says don't don't kill don't hate don't wish people terrible things. Don't don't get off on fantasizing how this person could be torn apart by a pack of wild wolves. Don't don't do that. Don't wish murderous things on people. And I remember there was a time when I would turn on the news and I I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Uh, there would be twitters from celebrities saying. I hope Trump gets raped. I hope that he gets shot and raped and killed. And I hope this person in the White House gets taken outside and flogged and their children taken away. And all there was all these tweets about people they didn't politically agreeing with the, this tirade of just unimaginably horrible things they wanted to have on these people. And this was on the news as something that we all need to aspire. This is how good people think. This is your, how you want to, the uh, opinion you want to have. This is how we're being groomed to think that, to normalize this. Yeah, well, so you bring up don't kill. And, and I know in um, some translations, it's don't murder. And I think about what, what makes murder murder is the intent i yes. can i will you know god forbid 
kill somebody accidentally. I, let's, you know, I, I accidentally back over them or something. And I could get charged with manslaughter, but not with murder. Because murder, what they're trying to find out if they're trying to land a charge uh, of murder on you is that you wanted to kill this person. So that's, that's what made, and we, we all recognize that that is so much worse. Yes, like negligence, that negligence that leads to somebody getting killed is really horrible. That's why it's a, a major crime, but it's much worse to want to kill somebody. And that, and why is it that we can all agree on that pretty, pretty easily? I don't think there's much, that's not very controversial is because the, the intent to kill, the intent to kill is this thing that's really demonic. And if it's about intent, then that intent can actually be there even if the degree is uh, of action is lessened the, the intent is still a problem so if you're saying well i wish something bad would happen to these people but i'm not going to do it the, if the intent is murder you can kind of look in and unpack your reasoning well why why don't i want to do it well i'm just not i you i don't want to kill someone but that's just because you don't want to go through the unpleasantness of it or you don't want to be guilty of it or you don't want to take the risk. There can still be that intent of like, of of murder in there. And it doesn't mean that all of us would do it. But if that intent's in there, it's up to us to recognize. Oh no, this is this is really messed up to 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 think to to harbor hatred. And what Swedenborg says is that he uses the analogy often of like embers that are glowing. If you've had a fire and there's a bunch of ash on top of it. There can still be hot coals in there that you can't see anymore because the ash is on top of them. He says that he, even stuff that we would say, oh, it's not killing, but I'm just harboring hatred towards this person. And I, yeah. I wouldn't enjoy if they died, but I would enjoy if they got humiliated. Um, that that has murder inside of it. That all that stuff, it doesn't mean, that we can't have this conversation if, it's like, if we're looking like, oh, no, am I guilty of murder? This conversation has to be, oh, hey, we have a chance here to identify and help stamp out this cause of, human strife and suffering, which is the tendency in all of us to nurture these feelings of hatred. So if we're looking at it that way, it, to, to me, it's, it's really clarifying to realize, oh, yeah, you can't just say, oh, well, there's, there's the bad kind of wishing somebody was harmed and then the, the good kind. Um, and you can't say it's a scale. Well, I just want that person to get a little hurt. Um, it, it's all about the intent. It doesn't mean that you can't say, look, this person has to understand w w the harm they're causing. And it doesn't mean you can't say, well, this person, that person needs to be locked up in prison. Yeah, that, that, that is, could be the best way to protect other people and ultimately the best way to protect them from getting more deeply involved in whatever e evil they might be involved in. But yeah. you have to, this, this, is a, this is something nobody else can tell you. You have to examine yourself and say, okay, what, do I care at all about this person's welfare or not? And if it's not, and, I, and I'm, it's really the, the difference between good and evil is what you take pleasure in. Mm. So if there's a sort of a pleasure in the idea of this person getting hurt, that's hell. If there's a pleasure in the idea of the protection for others or the setting that person straight or any of those things, then that can still be heaven. But, but if, it's, if we're harboring that pleasure in hatred, it's sure it's it's a smaller part per million, but it's still the same thing. That's what still falls under this the internal meaning of this you sh you shall not kill commandment because uh, it's it's the int the intent's there. It's smoldering, but as we know with coals, that can whip up into a fire really quick, which is why you get these like road rage kind of incidents. And I'm so glad we're talking about this because we're obviously in a very heated time and. Um... People don't think twice about casually saying, you know, terrible things. They want to, they, they can't wait till terrible things happen to people. And um, I, uh, I don't think most people realize uh, what they're spiritually doing to themselves. Um, it's, you know, it's <coughs> hating somebody and wishing somebody ill. I'm sure you've heard this old saying is like you drinking poison and expecting the person that you hate to drop dead. Yeah. Because it, 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 is, it is poison. Um, it, it's because very, it's it is, 
because hating yeah, right. people, hating your neighbor does not live in heaven. There's only one place that lives. And when you love that, that you live in the same place that that love lives. Yeah. And, and I think that an important point is that hate, hate tries to convince us that it's our friend, that yeah. it is protecting well, us. And, and of course there's a, there's a fine line because there is what I would call zeal. There is of course people who have had terrible things done to them can then have a zeal to get the right justice to happen. But I would say that a lot of what we go through, like if somebody has humiliated us or hurt us or something, and this hate comes in and says, I, I, oh, look, I'm protecting you from that person. I am helping to somehow re remedy this situation. But it's not actually, that's not actually the antidote. And Swedenborg would say that, that that's hell trying to use that wound to get, get you to live its lifestyle, get you to acquire a taste for hatred, which is not going to help you. And I think that, you know, there's been plenty of studies and books and things on how forgiveness is, it w will get you out of that loop in a way that hatred won't. So I, I don't think I, I need to defend that really uh, vigorously. Um, but it's important because I, I always feel like when I bring this up, I can hear in the back of my mind people talking about like, well, well you can't just let people walk on you. Um, no, you can't, but you also can't let hatred walk on you. And it, it's, it's really, we go back to the external and internal, like we were talking about before. The external actions, can, yeah, can be the whole, run the whole gambit. Yeah, it may, it could be in some really extreme situation, somebody's like charging at your family and you, and you have to kill them to protect yourself. Yeah, okay, but it's about your intent, you know, it, that it's, it's your intent, you know, did, did you, want to kill that would you have killed that person if they weren't going to harm you no if you if you could have in that second you know come up with some other way to stop them you, you would have right you would have preferred which would you have preferred you know if you would have preferred yeah. to not have to kill that person then that's actually it may seem like that doesn't matter but it does and i, I think we actually have a pretty good precedent for that in the way that that people are tried because <laughs> It, you know, I mean, in a, like a court of law. Yeah, self-defense, they, they, you know, and obviously each is one of these, it's, it's like a gray area on what is really self-defense and what isn't and, and what is murder, but what's not. But, but we try to strive towards an ideal where we can all recognize that, yeah, if, if it's not, and that's even why premeditated murder is, is I, I think I'm, I'm not like a legal scholar, but I, I think that it, you can get more time for premeditated murder than uh than not because the premeditated shows you like you weren't even in some kind of you snapped and you couldn't barely control yourself that you really knew what you were doing that's even worse i mean the, the first one is bad but it's even worse to not to not be pushed by anything so it's all about intent intent is how we we what we base our our legal system off of uh so look that that's a good way to look at ourselves it, it's the intent that matters we can get all hung up on is it you know, in to total pacifism versus uh, total aggression, warlike stuff. It's 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 about intent. That that's what the spiritual side of it is, and that's what Swedenborg talks about. An action can look the same action can look a thousand different ways if you're looking at it with spiritual eyes, like to to an angel, because it, it can have a thousand different motivations for it, and the motivation is what makes us who we are. Well, the you know the same external action can have you know, a same effect on people temporarily as far as what it, what it does to your spirit. Uh, it's all about what, you, what were you trying to do? And, and, and what, how do you feel about it now? You know, uh, right. It, it's not only in the moment, right. It's, you know, if, if you now don't aren't into negative stuff that you used to do and come out against it, I feel totally different about you than if you're still defending yourself about some, some terrible things you did. So, okay, yeah. there, there are a couple of thoughts on that. Yeah, I appreciate that, sweetheart, because that is, you know, when I was first going through Swedenborg, again, you know, through Christianity, he gets into uh, what the highest level of heaven, how they look at the Ten Commandments, how the second level of heaven, the spiritual level of heaven looks at the Ten Commandments, and how the third level of heaven looks at the Ten Commandments. And 
The third level of heaven was definitely closest to the stuff that I learned here on the earth plane. And um, uh, getting the, the other interpretations was, you know, how many times do we have the Paul on the road to Damascus experience where suddenly the, the scales are falling and we can see? <laughs> yeah. Getting the, the Swedenborg um, information is the only time that all of the things that I've studied, all the Christian theology, all of the Eastern theology, um, it, it, Swedenborg is the only thing that ties them all together and makes all of them make sense. It's the only thing that makes the profit and loss ledgers add up. Um, yeah, but I, heard I, you I don't. Too. I don't know if I would be uh, a religious kind of guy if I Didn't hadn't know. been around Swedenborg. I, I think I, I would. I mean, I'd probably be really attracted to what science is doing, and I, I just don't know. But because, as you said, it makes sense of everything through Roger's framework, it it has. Get, gotten me to see the value I wouldn't have seen. Yes, yes. And, you know, um, one of the things that Swedenborg talks about is that you don't have to be a Christian to go to heaven. Uh, there are plenty of people that are not Christians that are in heaven because, it, as you said, it goes back to your intent. Do you love what's good and true? Do you think what's true? Do you do what's good? Do you love your neighbor? R right there, we have heaven. Yeah. And um, Right uh, Swedenborg uh, does do a shout out, if if you could use that 21st century term for 17th century writing. He does do a shout out to the African forms of spirituality and how when he looked at them at the spiritual world, how deeply profound and spiritually connected they were. And, you know, it reminded me when um, you were doing the two shows on the rituals when I lived in San Francisco, there was a, a friend of mine that was a numerologist that was really into, um, um, I forget the, the, the African religion. And uh, he sent me to a woman that um, he thought could help me with some spiritual healing. So I went to see the woman and um, she said, um, this is what I'm guided to tell you. Um, she said, go get some flowers that are meaningful to you and then go to the ocean and throw the flowers out on the tide with the intention that you are releasing everything that is not good and true from your mind and from your life and put it on the ocean for the tide to take out. And I said, that's it. Just throw the flowers out there with that intention. And she said, yeah, will you try it? And I said, sure, how will I know if it's valuable if I don't try it? So I did, you know, the prayers. Uh, and I had a passion flower vine in my yard. And those are flowers that are meaningful to me. So um, they can be really prolific bloomers. So I had a big bag of flowers because I figured, you know, we never had a shortage of crap to release. And um, uh, drove to San Francisco to the beach and parked the car, got out, uh, walked into the water, you know, maybe up to my knees or something, and just did prayers and put all the flowers out to release anything that wasn't good and true. And um, by the time I got to the car, I felt like I weighed a million pounds and that moving was such, an, like I had been drained of all the energy that I had. I remember getting in the car and feeling like I could barely have the energy to shut the door. And I went home, yeah. stumbled into bed, slept for 12 hours, woke up the next morning and felt great. Everybody yeah. well, that's beautiful. Ever suggested that they do that ritual, told me they had the same experience. They went there energized, happy to do it. I'm at the beach, I'm having fun. You throw the flowers out. By the time you make it to your car, you are, you, you you're, you're just so drained of energy, you feel like you can't move. It was definitely a massive release and reorganizing of energy on some level. But when I heard Swedenborg talk about how the African religions, that he particularly valued their modality of worship and connection to the spirit, it reminded me of that flower throwing ritual. That might be their, their uh, communion, I don't know. Yeah, right. I think it would be strange if 
only only let's say Christian tradition had the means of of connection and and salvation inside it. it would just be bizarre. And I think what that what you experience there is really real, and it probably is based on correspondences. Swedenborg says that ancient religions all over the world understood correspondences in a way that that actually was lost in in a lot of modern civilization so a lot of the religious practices that are are handed down uh, are based in correspondences he talks about people all over the world even in his day having encounters he even talks about in africa in particular there was people there who were getting a revelation at the same time that he was um and Hmm. you think back to what we're saying about um loving what's good and loving being kind that that feeling is heaven so yes you can definitely have that outside of any religious body Swedenborg is always this interesting mix of they'll say yeah it it can anybody can can go to heaven but there's also it does matter what truth you have at the same time he actually he had a positive both like a really positive and really negative view of the Christian world that he was in Mm. He he talked about that the Christian world in his day, right, mid 1700s. Um, I don't know how close the the current state of Christianity is to that, but that it was just it was just rotten to the core. That he talked about it, it was just full of hypocrisy and pe- it, people claiming to live godly lives but engaging in all kinds of harmful, heinous activities toward each other, that it was all just a show. But he also critiqued that the church's teachings didn't make any sense and that they had, through grabbing on to particular ideas, one of them was faith alone. He did a huge amount of damage. He said that that actually, even though there is this absolute power in the Bible and absolute truth in Jesus Christ and the, the stories of Jesus and that Jesus was God, like just like Christians believe, um, because the Christians around him had so soaked their mind in falsities and become adamant about them, that it was often harder for them to accept heaven after death than it was for people who were non-Christian. And, and then, you know, he mentioned Africans and others because it's really about do you cultivate a love for what's good? And goodness le- brings truth along with it. So if you love what's good, then you have no resistance to soaking up the truth like a sponge when you hear it. But if you don't love what's good and you've got truth sort of under siege, because let's say you're a religious person, like a religious Christian person that has some ideas about Jesus and, and about uh faith and and all the rituals and whatever, but but you're really using that. You haven't really done the work of regeneration and repentance. And you're just using that to justify your your negative feelings of hatred towards other people and and breaking the internal sense of the commandments. Then you it's gonna be very hard for you to be divested of that because you believe you don't notice like when anybody, religious or not, believes they've got things figured out, it's very hard to get them to change because they don't think they need to change they, they think they're so they've got an echo chamber going well i've my, my religious teachings which i put on a pedestal justify my negative inner habits it's very hard to break someone out of that loop so uh be humility humility is essential and and just know that in revelation it says flee to the mountain when things get hard flee to the mountain the mountains correspond to love so when when you don't know what's going on when everything seems crazy, you, you, everything is confusing and, and big disruption is happening, love, go to love. It, you, okay, I see this person across from me. They believe something that's really freaky to me, and I don't know where this is all going. Okay, the first thing is, okay, what, where can I find love right now? And try to be acting. If I, Even if I'm trying to debate this person or, or to stop legislation they want to pass or something, just make sure that I can know, all right, I, I don't desire the harm of this person or the person the people that they represent um i am trying to do what i think is best for everyone and that doesn't mean we have to agree with each other but it means we, we're all 
if, if ultimately everyone's trying to do what they really believe is right, I can live with those differences. You know, the, what we want to do is separate out clearly, like, okay, get it so the human race can recognize the difference between trying to do what you believe is right, even if it's misguided, and willingly and, and knowingly um, enjoying harming other people and exploiting yeah. other people uh, yeah. for yourself. So cause that's the difference between heaven and hell. Yeah, yeah, heaven doesn't uh, doesn't have a got ya agenda. That that's not it's not looking for a got ya argument or point. Um, yeah, you know, Swedenborg makes this makes this um really astonishing claim to, to I'm sure to a Christian audience in the day, back in his day, which is like somebody could, uh, you know, I forget exactly how he words it, but spread Christianity to the entire world, and do it for a selfish reason, and that wouldn't that wouldn't be good. Like it wouldn't it wouldn't be good for their spirit. And it could be somebody could attack the Christian church and destroy it, but have been doing that because they from a good motive, and angels wouldn't wouldn't blame them for it. Yeah, you know, it's really a the motive is what matters. The motive is heaven or hell. You know, um, you remember Daniel Brinkley, the the guy saved by the light, the NDE famous NDE. Yep. You know, one of the first thing he writes about that surprised him that he learned in his NDE. Everything in the spiritual world is determined by intention. Everything. Yeah, right. And uh, that was the first thing that let me know he really did have an NDE because uh, clearly the way he lived his life before, he did not get that. And there's only one place you can get the truth from, and it's not an untruthful source. Um, We've just got we, uh, two minutes left, sweetheart. And I, I really, you did a show about anxiety and about how the community uh, that uh, feeds off of anxiety connects to our stomach and it likes partially undigested food. And there was a <laughs> lot about that episode that I, I think I want to really encourage people to look up the anxiety episode. But if you would talk about that, about how our anxiety is. Uh, not necessarily a private event. Nothing's a private event. It just, I mean, n- nothing externally is a private event, especially now. The clothes that you're wearing are not a private event. They were, you don't know who made them. They were made by somebody somewhere in the world, some combination of machines and people. They were shipped by a process that, that we don't really track, uh, that, that none of us individually know. They were designed by somebody that you don't know, and those people were inspired by previous designs, which were made by previous people. There is there's nothing private about the clothes we're wearing, the food that we're buying, um, even the personalities that we have. We are so shaped by the culture, right? Isn't everyone talking about how it's so problematic that there are all these social media bubbles where people get yeah. this group think, right? They all, they all think like each other. It's because we're shaped by the people around us. So Swedenborg says, actually, that, that same communal existence is happens in the afterlife and you are a body and a spirit you have a spirit that's in the afterlife right now so just like you are influenced by the physical people you have community around or you're listening to your spirit is there and even though you don't realize it it is listening to this the spirits that are around it to the spiritual neighborhood that it's in so you can and that all psychological psychological phenomena is traceable to events in the spiritual world that's that's that that world is the world of consciousness so yes, Swedenborg had this visceral experience of becoming aware of the spiritual influence on the physical. And he saw that, that he would have, because he had consciousness in both areas at the same time, he would see that there were certain spirits that when they approached him, it would cause feelings in him. It would make him feel anxious. It would make him get convictions about certain things. But he, he was amazed by his malleability and, and understanding just how much of an influence uh, the greater human race. Remember when I say spirits, or just talking about people that used to live here that are dead. So you think about right now, you, I'm sure you all know somebody who, who is listening to someone, maybe through social media or through TV or something that you feel like, oh, that person is totally being misled by these people they're listening to. Well, there are people just like that in the spiritual world that it's not, I don't know the exact, it's not as direct one-to-one as that person is like talking to us, but something about our existence in that place in the spiritual world is can lead to all kinds of effects on us. So, I mean, the takeaway is when you're feeling anxiety, when you're getting, we're talking about that hatred we had before and you're sitting here and this, why, what is the act 
of hating someone. It is you're sitting there and suddenly uh, an idea that incites you towards hatred comes along and a feeling accompanies that. Where, where does that come from? Yes. What, why, what's the start of that chain? And Sumer would say, well, that's hell. There's spirits, people who have devoted their life to that kind of hatred and have a pleasure in it are yes. saying to you essentially, hey, don't you want to be like us? Don't you want to enjoy us? Because your intent is like gravity there. So your intent pulls you into community with other people who have a similar intent. So as we're nursing this hatred intent, it brings us into the middle of, you know, sucks you to the center of a community of people who love that same thing. So that's, that's the quick version of, of how much uh, the spiritual world is affecting our conscious experience. And um, uh, we're, again, the fastest hour is always the hour of live broadcast. And um, uh, please uh, tell um, Chelsea and uh, Jonathan Rose that we love those Swedenborg stories and Inside Off the Left Eye podcast. Great. Yes, I will do. And as, as always, thank you for so much, Curtis, for being so generous with your time. And I want to encourage our listening audience, if you'd like more of the gold standard of spiritual teaching, uh, please go to offtheleftei.com or go to youtube.com forward slash off the left eye. And until we do it again next week, rock on, baby. You've been listening to You Are What You Love with author Waishali. To order Waishali's book, You Are What You Love, or to schedule a private self-emergent session with Waishali, visit youarewhatyoulove.com. Thanks for joining us, and remember, you are what you love, and you love whatever you give your attention to. So love wisely.